who am I? Richard Casimer, media veteran. Why I got in radio is because I'm good with a knife. Contributor in Perth, Australia. Our friend Richard Casimer in the United States. How are you guys enjoying the 19th century? Is that working out for you? How can you say, I'm not making fun of you as a race, I'm making fun of you as black performers? I think as a country, Americans are as patriotic as the most rabid UK football hooligan. Who am I? Richard S. Casimer. Balls Radio with Phil Dobby. Now, the biggest news from the United States this week has probably been that verdict on the police officer who shot dead an innocent black, unarmed 18-year-old in the uh, streets of Ferguson. It was big news at the time. Well, this week, Darren Wilson, the officer responsible, seems to have got off uh, scot-free. Uh, let's go to the United States and find out more about this. I, I mean, there's been some uh, some rioting as a result of this, hasn't there, Richard? Yes, uh, scot free for the moment. Uh, a grand jury failed to find enough evidence to indict police officer Darren Wilson for the killing of, as you say, uh, unarmed teenager Michael Brown in the St. Louis suburb of Ferguson, Missouri, back on August the 9th. The shooting then resulted in days of violent and very destructive protest, as well as the governor of the state having to call out the National Guard to restore peace to the area. It also mm. opened up a very, <clears throat> excuse me, much needed national conversation here as high up as the president on the disproportionate amount of African-Americans who were killed at the hands of police in this country for what many claim facetiously is the crime of simply walking or driving while being black. Now, as a result of this exoneration of Officer Wilson Ferguson and then a few neighboring towns once again felt the wrath of anger uh, and several nights of looting, burnings, store burnings, car burnings, you name it, uh, have been going on. Things have calmed down a little bit, but it's the, still the, the national discourse and uh, dissatisfaction is but going on here. Interesting to see the line Obama took on this. So he wasn't necessarily, because the easiest thing in the world would be, of course, to decry uh, all, of, all of that violence and uh, to announce it all. And, that, and that's fine, you know, and he obviously hasn't, hasn't said it's a good thing. But he's also said to the police, don't attack people who are, who are clearly doing nothing wrong. He's sort of, sort of like been trying to toe the line in both directions on this, hasn't he? Yes, he has, uh, as has Michael Brown's family. And they're saying, look, let's, let's not do this to our town, to our cities in our country let's let the system work itself out and again we see what the grand jury does phil is that it's it's supposed to weigh any and all information and decide whether there's enough probable cause to then proceed with a trial and so that whomever can answer these charges it is not supposed to be a trial in and of itself however what happened was in many of the critics why they're upset is that the prosecuting attorney Robert McCullough treated the grand jury as if it was a trial. And many people are saying that he was on the side of officer uh, Wilson and they, the, the conflicting reports, the evidence, uh, eyewitness evidence uh, was overwhelmingly in favor of Michael Brown and discredited many of the stories that officer Wilson claimed happened, that there was a confrontation that the, the very uh, large uh, Michael Brown pulled him out or tried to pull him out of uh, his police cruiser. Uh, Officer Wilson fired 12 shots at Michael Brown, uh, a six or more hitting him, two in the head and killing him instantly. Uh, so there's a lot of that going on. Now, this is far from the end of this. Even though the grand jury has ruled there wasn't enough evidence to indict him and bring him to trial on charges, uh, the family and other people can sue Officer Wilson for civil charges, much like uh, the Brown family did in the O.J. Simpson case, yeah. where O.J. Uh, got off on murder charges, but uh, Nicole Brown, his 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 dead wife, his, their family sued him for civil charges. So this could go on, uh, but in the meantime, we're still getting, seeing this sort of uh, rioting, whether or not it's ne'er-do-wells coming from away that are just overtaking the town of Ferguson. And even here in Boston, uh, the, the night that the, um, uh, the grand jury released their findings, there were protests in Boston, Chicago, New York, all over this country. Yeah. Yeah, well, that's what tends to happen, isn't it? I mean, it, you know, because it, it, it's a, it's not a Ferguson issue, is it? It's a, it's a, it's a national issue. It is a national issue. Now, since the ruling just the other day, uh, Officer Wilson 
uh, has resigned from the Ferguson police force, but don't worry about him finding any work. I'm sure he'll land on his feet at Fox news as being one of their legal experts. <laughs> you know, and I think of too, is, I mean, going back to the, to the protest and the rioting, it, it is, it is senseless. I mean, we can certainly gonna understand the anger, but this yeah. type of rioting does no good to any cause. And I believe it was Mahatma Gandhi that said the most effective way to accomplish social change is, is to steal a widescreen TV. <laughs> Why is that? <laughs> I just thought, I'm just being <laughs> the usual anyway. knucklehead that I am. <laughs> All right, okay, I'm with you. Now, uh, it is officially, well, maybe you're stealing the widescreen TV uh, as a Christmas present. How about that for a segue? It's uh, it's because it is, of course, officially now, I think, the Christmas season, isn't it? We've actually we've got our, our Christmas tree up in the Dobby household. And um, look, my my father-in-law uh, was was American, and when he celebrated Thanksgiving, that was the sign that it was you know on for young and old. Christmas season was upon us, and of course, you had Thanksgiving this week. But also, there's this strange thing which has uh, taken over the world: Black Friday, and the two tend to coincide. It's a bit confusing, isn't it? Yes, Christmas comes but once too often here in America. <laughs> It's a, yeah, another crazed American pre-Christmas shopping tradition has come and gone this week. It's uh, this year, though, with with a lot less lunacy and carnage than in years past. And of course, I'm talking about Black Friday. This is the day after Thanksgiving when the retailers offer what they claim are their best bargains of the year and would like yeah. you to believe as such. It's called Black Friday because this is the last chance to retailers get uh, get a chance to get out of the red in, into the black before the end of the fourth quarter sales projections. So what they do is they create this frenzied call to action and they want you to come in the day after Thanksgiving and with these bust out uh, uh, once a year savings, these drastically discounted prices on anything, all the crap that you don't need, but they want to yeah. push. But Everything I, that's moving slowly must go. Exactly. Basically. Yeah. Well, mm. this year, a lot of the retailers entered this real controversial gray area where they were opening on Thanksgiving Day in the states that allow this. Now, here in New England, a lot of the states have blue laws on the books. And the blue law is, is that you cannot open on a national holiday. You can open at midnight, but you cannot open any earlier than that. In wow. some states, okay. they were actually opening on Thanksgiving Day. As early as noon, some of the retailers were telling their employees, if you don't show up for work, don't bother coming in anymore because you're fired. So that was a big, that was a big hoopla. What happened right. though, and statistically this has been proven year after year, is that you don't generate any more traffic to your store the, the earlier you open. So the people that were coming in at, let's say last year at midnight on Thanksgiving day, now we're coming in at noon on Thanksgiving Day. It took away from the sales on Friday itself. It didn't generate yeah. more traffic. It just moved them from one hour block to another. And so I think, more cost, no more revenue. No, I mean, and, and so yeah. what I think you're going to see is that next year, because it's, it's going to cost employers uh, more money to pay these employees to come in on the holiday if they get holiday pay, that they're just going to look at the books and go, you know what, this isn't worth it. We'll just go back to opening on Friday. And now it's, it's Black Friday weekend. But what's crazy about this, Phil, is that these are not spectacular deals. Because mm -hmm. in as we approach Christmas, you will see the retailers have the same discounts as you will the, the day after Christmas. Is that well, they, glad, it's the same thing. So I'm glad you explained what Black Friday is all about. Because I did wonder what, what is the black in Black Friday. But yeah. you've just explained it's getting uh, getting the books back into the black for that uh, for that final quarter, which of course is based on your financial year, which is different to our financial year. So I don't know why we've adopted it here in Australia as well, which we have to an extent. Well, I guess it it's because it spills over to online, doesn't it? And we yeah, you know, yes, we'll it does. Stuff and, internationally online, and yeah. the online shoppers are taking away the traffic from the uh, brick and mortar retailers. So we're seeing a lot, oh, of, no. especially with the re the online, uh, and, and it's the same companies too. The same companies that have a brick and mortar house, yeah. they 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 have a catalog, they have the internet, and they have a, a physical location. So the online now is taking away because they're offering free shipping. So again, I, I think you're going to see this this tradition is go, going to fall out of popularity, much like public hangings and voting. So. <laughs> oh, you don't do public hangings anymore? No. Oh, no. I'm so misinformed. People are too lazy. Uh, that, they don't want to go out. <laughs> oh, that's true. They want to watch yeah, it yeah. online. If you can, exactly. If, if Fox, well, I'm sure Fox News would televise it, wouldn't they? <laughs> oh, only, only too happy to, I would have thought. It would look Good like ratings, a board ratings. meeting. 
<laughs> so um, just before we move on from this, um, I mean, I'm surprised actually that, you know, the states where you can't open on Thanksgiving because Thanksgiving wouldn't be as significant a day as Christmas Day is in the United States, would it? Or is it, or is it on a par with that? It is. It is. It is one of the, you know, I mean, it's, it's less reverential uh, mm. and there's no religious connotation per se, but it is one of the, the few holidays where people actually g- gather as right. a family and as friends and do that. So to take, the, to take that away the, from the employees is, is a yeah. little strange. Well, the only days that the shops are closed here by law, uh, and even then not all shops is Christmas day, good Friday, Easter Sunday, and half of Anzac day. So they're the only day. So is it sort of like a similar sort of a number of days in the U S or have you got more days? Is it cause you're sort of like making it sound like any public holiday, the shops can't open. No, no, uh, quite the contrary. At public holidays, whether it's President's Day, which they lumped all the presidents into into one, or the pre- the ce- presidents that we celebrate, where it's Washington, uh, you know, Jefferson and Lincoln's birthday. They used to be separate holidays. Now they put them into one. But, well, but how many presidents? They, thank God for that. How many presidents have you had? Fifty or so? Or uh, how many? I, th- I some would say not enough. Some would say too many. No, we we were at. I I don't know. Don't don't ask me. I, <laughs> home is where home holiday. is where my pants are. You know, I, I've forgotten more about this country than than you'll ever know. Um, anyway, so how many how many days are the shops forced forced to close? I guess is my question. Uh, thank thank. Well, again, it depends on the state. It, yeah, yeah. It's it's you it, Christmas and and Thanksgiving, but you know Fourth of right. July and all those holidays. No, you can stay open it, it, whenever you want, it's as long as you want. They're not, but it depends on the state because here in especially here in New England. Which was settled by the the uh, the Puritans. Why they're called blue laws is the laws were on uh, blue paper, and those were the laws like Sunday liquor sales. You couldn't do that for the and for many many generations you couldn't sell cars on a Sunday. Car dealerships could not be open, but mm. now it's turned around to meet customer demand. So I will I would not um, be surprised if at some point in the very near future that it's twenty four seven. Uh, shopping it's whatever yeah. the market will bear I, and i think we, as it should be we do christmas shopping on christmas morning uh <laughs> you'd have to do you have to do it early though wouldn't you? you'd have to do it before five o'clock when the kids wake up um now uh we're talking about online and how the influence that's had on black friday i mean online is influencing everything of course and uber is a great example this ride sharing company which is all over the world and uh, upsetting taxi drivers all over the world uh it's now been deemed illegal in at least uh, one u.s state yeah, uh, Uber had its tires slashed in the state of Nevada. The uh, Uber was suspending, uh, has been forced to suspend st- service in the home of Las Vegas. Uh, taxi companies and some other companies, uh, ride service companies, uh, came out and uh, filed a lawsuit against them uh, because they Uber doesn't have to meet the strict standards that taxi companies have to meet uh, to to uh, function in any state. And so, what a district court judge did was he issued a preliminary injunction that prevents the company from operating in Nevada. And it looks like some other states are also going to be successful in following suit. This move will cost Uber about 1000 jobs in that state. Now how Uber works, it's a, it's a smartphone and a computer app. People sign up to participate with Uber as either a driver or a car lender. The user then uses the app to connect with the driver or the vehicle through Uber Payment is exchanged, destinations are reached, everybody's happy. So think of it as the old ride boards from back in the hippie days of the 60s and 70s, only yeah. without the patchouli stink and the and the bad Rod McEwen poetry you had to endure on the ride. And not so, necessarily. I mean, you don't, you've got no guarantee that that's not going to happen, of course. You no, might have right. some, someone hails back from the 60s who's got a car. From well, it, the could 60s. Be like the, it could be like the dating <laughs> services like, you know, do you like uh, Rod McEwen? Uh-uh, I'm, not, I'm not going with you. But, but the good thing is, like like all of these things, everyone rates it, don't they? So if you have a bad driver, everyone says this was a bad driver. So hopefully no one else goes with that driver because they've got a poor rating. Yes, yes. Um, this is not the first time that Uber has been in trouble. Uh, a U.S. judge in California ruled this past week that the CEO, Travis Kalaknik, has to disclose emails to the attorneys of a person who's filing a class action shoot, suit against Uber uh, uh, claiming that Uber's ad that cl- uh, says that 20% of the gratuity is going to the drivers is actually false, misleading, and likely to deceive members of the public is what the claim is saying. The claim Go goes on. on to say that Uber also keeps more of the money than it doles out to the drivers. 
Uber is also under uh, fire for some other violations. In a, in a Uber executive opened up his mouth and set off a firestorm with some journalists. He was saying that he he's considering that the company should hire researchers to examine and disclose activities of media critics who have been bringing all this trouble to light, which sounds like business as usual here for most American companies anyways. Yeah, yeah. All right. So doing the dirty, doing the trying to get the dirt on them. So um, cab charge here uh, is, you know, the the company that's upset because that's the company that basically has uh, most of the billing for uh, for existing cabs. You know, everyone's got a cab charge machine in. They provide the uh, the tool that tells you uh, who's looking for a ride and then takes all the payments and everything. So naturally, they're upset because it's it's digging into their revenue stream. So they're saying yes, it's dangerous. It's it should be illegal. They don't pay tax in Australia. And they make it difficult to track the money that's earned by drivers. So everywhere around the world, I think everyone's getting upset by Uber. But it's another, I mean, there's lots of these things, isn't there? It's not just in in uh, in terms of driving. You look at what Airbnb is doing as well, you know, where similar similar sort of thing, isn't it? Where people are saying, well, people are staying in these properties. These are not council approved for being rented out. They, you know, don't have to follow the same standards that hotels or guest houses do. Uh, you know, the, the Internet is going to keep on challenging this sort of thing. And I guess it's going to keep lawyers very busy. They're going to be the ones happy at the end of all of this. Yeah, it's it's a little I'm not sure where it's going to go because the smoke is out of the bottle. And because it's a private car, it's it's like if I want to get involved with Uber and use my car either as a driver or let somebody else drive it. My car passed inspection. My car is is you know is drivable. So therefore, why sh- and I'm and if I'm not doing the driving, why should I have to adhere to the standards of a, either an independent cab driver or somebody or a cab service? So mm. I I think this isn't going to be cut and dry. I think that this is going to open up a whole Pandora's box on this new wave of uh, cyber technology and cyber commerce. Yeah. And it's all to do with sort of like consumer collaboration, isn't it? It's, uh, you know, sharing stuff rather than us going out and buying stuff for ourselves. Let's share the resources. So, I mean, the idea behind it is good. It's just we've just got to find the the workable model that's going to be uh, that that is going to keep everyone happy. You know, it's like self-drive cars. I love the idea. There's a apparently it might be Helsinki. Their transport policy is that in 10 years, which seems quite a bold uh, statement, they want to make it irrelevant having a car in their city because they want you to be able to go to an app and say, I want to go from here to here and a self-drive car will come and pick you up, take you to the nearest mode of of public transport. You use public transport to get to the nearest uh, end point. And then another self-drive car takes you for the for the final stage. Imagine that. Hmm. How cool would that be? I just um, I just use Google Map and that's it because I can do it, you know, in my pajamas. Yeah, but this is sort of like you know you don't need the car because they're going to uh, deliver one to you, uh, and then you rely on public transport. Of course, you've got to have a good public transport system for it all to work. But that's their ten year vision. What about that for a transport strategy? I love it. Uh, I, I think it's going to be a long time before we sort of see that sort of vision here in Australia and in the United States. Of course, the idea that public. I mean, you you've heard of public transport, haven't you? Will will robots be driving this? <laughs> well, yeah, well, I think that's the idea. Yeah, I think the you know it's uh, using the Google self drive car. You know, uh, now uh, finally an admission from the Church of uh, the Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints or the Mormons, as we know. The founder was uh, well, he had lots of wives. Some of them a little bit young, so it's fair to say uh, this. This sounds like an admission that their leader was a pedophile, doesn't it? Uh, well, yeah, it could be if that's. Uh... If that's how you see it, sure. I, you know, and excuse me for going all Catherine Devney on you, but I always <laughs> find it interesting when a, the a pretentious holier-than-thou faiths get up to their knickers in the skeletons that fall out of the closet. Also, any religion that's younger than a typewriter, I, th- I think, is a little strange. Now, it's been yeah. long suspected that the founder of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, the Mormons, Joseph Smith, that, that he was a polygamist. Now, this is something that the Mormon Church has not necessarily denied but they've certainly avoided confirming it, considering that having multiple wives is, is frowned upon by uh, Mormons here in the United States, as well as U.S. law. Now, earlier this month, the church finally admitted that Smith did indeed start collecting his wives back in 1827. But the details now that are coming out are really shedding an even dimmer light on this pious, holier-than-thou religion that is of Mitt Romney, uh, Donnie and Marie Osmond uh, are Mormons. The Mormons also believe that non-whites aren't allowed in heaven because 
God tainted their skin to show their unworthiness. <laughs> now, my, speaking of Donnie yeah. and Marie, the, these are the same non-whites that, that include Michael Jackson and his family, who were also Mormons. Right now, according Gee, to the, I wonder is that is that why Michael Jackson suddenly decided he was going to turn white? Or oh no, of course it was the skin disease, wasn't it? That, yeah, uh, well, we and, and he and he did a Pepsi commercial, and Mormons are not supposed to drink caffeine. Well, mm. according to the historical documents that have surfaced, uh, Smith took as many as thirty-three plural wives, as they're called, some as young as fourteen, some as old as their mid-fifties. The most of them, though, in their early twenties. 33% of Smith's wives were already married to other men when he procured them. Now, like right. all of the religions that have a dark past, the Mormons, uh, the hierarchy especially, are claiming that Smith's stable of wives was actually an edict from God as opposed to having an overactive libido. Yes, and so course it's... <laughs> hmm. I mean, well, 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 how would it be anything else? And of course, all these 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 young wives, these underage wives, obviously never had sex with them. You know, I mean, they were they were just there to uh, to spend on the credit card, and that's it. Yeah. Well, th no, he had sex with them. Uh, what they're doing too is in an attempt now to put this positive spin on this is that the uh, Mormons are now focusing on all the great things that his wives had done to further the religion and you know i guess to their credit they they did they did go on to become instrumental leaders and um matriarchs in the the mormon religion so they're right. stressing the importance of these women in the church rather than you know, that he had so many of them so, so they did a good <laughs> job of getting people into the mormon church but what is the good of getting people into the mormon church is the question i mean you know so what what good? What good's the Mormon Church done? The Mormon Church makes a pant load of money for the Mormon Church. Oh, right, they okay. this I now as long as they've got a business model. Yes. Well, now it's just I, everything ultimately being about me, which is my religion. Is that years ago I used to work for an advertising agency that only did car dealerships, some of the top car dealerships in the country. We flew out to Salt Lake City, Utah, which is a high uh, Mormon conclave. That's where the Mormon Tabernacle is. And we had to interview. I was the guy off camera that interviewed customers uh, in these dealerships. So we had a Mormon couple in with their 19 kids. And the, hus the, the wife stood about three steps behind the husband. And they had, a, they had purchased the minivan. So I'm talking to the gentleman. And, and I'm actually talking to the wife. And I'm saying, what do you like about this minivan? And, she, and he answered, my wife likes it because blah, blah, blah. And I said, what do you do with it? And he says, we do it, we use it for church business. And I said, what is your church business? And he said, it's church business. And you never know what, what the Mormons do to make money, but they make mm. a lot of it. They're very affluent people for the most part. And that's just, a, it's, it's a secret society that's been going on for, for generations here, again, since 1827 or so. And bless their hearts. You've got me curious now. So, how do the Mormons make their money? There's a so no one's ever found the answer to that. They do. Uh, they do work well, they got, the work got, of God. They do the work of the church. And and I honestly, I don't know. I I. What well, is everyone giving them a slice of their income, and, they, and so they go after the celebrities who've got a lot of money? Isn't that isn't that part and parcel? The, of it? There is a kind of a pyramid scheme that goes on again, just like in any religion, from Catholicism on down. Uh, that, they must be so annoyed that Donnie and Marie's albums aren't selling so much these days, mustn't they? That, well, Donnie and Marie are doing quite well and uh, making a, a lucrative living in Las Vegas. They have a great show that a, a friend of mine just was out there and saw them, and they're doing extremely well in Vegas. Right. Donnie and Marie, live on stage. Bring your wives and, uh, and come and have a good time. It, 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 Mormons <laughs> in Sin City making money. You know, go figure. <laughs> all god's work all right well good to talk um and uh, we'll talk to you again next week it's getting very close to christmas have you done all your shopping are you ready for it i give everyone the same thing each year strep throat one <laughs> one size fits all and has festive holiday colors so yeah that's what i give <laughs> bah humbug all right see you next week all right brother take care